Cardiac disease affects many Australians each year. Before the 70s, the condition for most spelled the end of a productive life. Today, with the advances of medicine, surgical techniques, monitoring and cardiac rehabilitation, the disease is under a far greater degree of control. Australia has one of the highest incidents of cardiac disease worldwide. New South Wales is 10% higher than the national average and Western Sydney 20% higher than the state average. Western Sydney is referred to by some as the cardiac capital of the world. Toward the end of the 70s, Parramatta Hospital was to develop a revolutionary cardiac rehabilitation program that was to change the face of cardiac care. The sister in charge of this unit was Sister Doreen Hennessy. Yeah, I became involved in, in an era of cardiac treatment when the coronary care unit first came um, to vogue. And this was sort of in the late 60s, early 70s. Prior to this, patients were nursed in, in large medical wards and um, they were kept in bed for six to eight weeks in the early 60s when I started my training. And when a patient got out of bed, um, they collapsed and mostly died because when you're in bed for six to eight weeks and someone gets you out of bed, your, your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure falls. And so they obviously go into a shock situation. In 1972, uh, when I became a sister in charge of the coronary care unit at Parramatta, um, cardiac monitoring and this type of thing was, was very um, new and, and exciting. And so we, we conquered the cardiac arrest situation in many ways by, by treating the arrhythmias and, and this type of thing. So a lot more patients were living that would have died. However, they weren't living. They, they, were, they were wrapped in cotton wool, they were scared, they were terrified. So I started an education program of the patient while they were in hospital, explaining what a heart attack was to them in, in lay terms. Dr David Cody, who was the honorary director of the unit, uh, and I started early ambulation. In 1975, we were getting patients out of bed within sort of um, two days of their admission. This was unheard of. And, and some people used to look at us as if we were, uh, you know, from another planet. A few months after that, we found out that the earlier they got up, the quicker they got better. Now, some of these patients were living in units on the third floor. So, so uh, I thought, well, why not make them walk up two flights of stairs before they go home so they know that they're, they're not going to get the chest pain when they walk up the two flights of stairs to their, to their unit. Um, so this became a regime. So the patients had to do two flights of stairs without chest pain. Their pulse was taken before, their pulse was taken after. So this was a form of, of cardiac rehabilitation, but it was not actually um, documented as such. In 1977, Sister Hennessy applied for and won a scholarship to study cardiac care in other countries. Whilst in Canada, she visited the Cardiac Institute at Edmonton. The institute was supervised by cardiologist Dr. Talibi and was built by the people of Edmonton with the aim of helping cardiac patients return to a normal life. In the months to follow her return, Sister Hennessy used this experience as a model to help set up the cardiac rehabilitation program in Parramatta Hospital. In the late 70s, when we, in 1978, exercised the first patient, um, 10 days after an infarct. It was exciting. It was, it was everything that I ever wished to do. It was also very frightening um, because although I'd seen it all working in, in Canada and knew it was safe, uh, the first patient was exercised in front of um, the, uh, the doctors from the Heart Foundation, the medical directors, uh, and, and physicians from Parramatta Hospital um, and I was just there with one bike and a little machine. But that first patient did well and actually lived until 1997. Uh, so within sort of t um, two months I had about 40 patients and, and I was just one staff and then it grew and then I got more staff, uh, more patients at some stage stage we used to have 65 patients a day um, j just in a session in the evening where, where we used to run the cardiac gymnasium which was also really a lot of fun the nursing staff did it in their own time uh, we just used the hospital's equipment 
and sometimes we had um, up to 80 patients in an evening just coming in, skipping rope, um, bench stepping, uh, using some of the equipment, calisthenics. All this was done by these cardiac patients. 20 years after the establishment of the cardiac program, the original patients met at an anniversary dinner to reminisce, renew acquaintances and share 20 years of life after cardiac treatment. When I had the heart attack, I, I, you know, I, I thought the end of the world had come. And uh, with the cooperation from Doreen and the people down there, and this thing, I realised it wasn't the end of the world, you know. main thing about the clinic in those days was the confidence it gave you to do things that you were never quite sure of. It was the single most important thing to making me realise that I wasn't totally useless after the operation because you arrive at the, uh, at the exercise clinic and uh, you, you, know, you, you have absolutely no confidence in yourself at all. But they, put you, they wire you up and they put you on the treadmill and you realise after walking about 10 minutes, you know, and they push you quite hard as well, and you realise that you know, you're not so totally useless after all. You know, you, there is still something left in you. Having a heart attack is a very um, shattering experience. And when I started to go to the clinic, I got confidence uh, doing the exercises that um, Doreen recommended. Uh, and I'm very grateful to her for that. I just think it's been a big saviour to people who have had heart attacks. And my heartfelt thanks to Doreen and Libby. That's it. I have been in cardiology practice now for 20 years, and there's no doubt that over that time, I've seen some quite amazing developments in the uh, treatment of myocardial infarction and uh, the return to um, work of, and normal activities of uh, these patients who uh, previously um, were quite likely to have suffered quite uh, major problems. There's no doubt that over that period of time, uh, the incidence of coronary artery disease, uh, the incidence of death of coronary artery disease has declined, but people are still suffering quite frequently infarcts, unstable angina, um, requiring quite frequent admission to hospitals. There is still um, a quite a strong social and psychological stigma to suffering myocardial infarction. It's a great concern to the patient and his family and also to the workforce. So it really does not matter if the patient has been in hospital for a short period of time or a long period of time. It still takes quite considerable uh, time and effort to uh, have these people return to their normal levels of activity. An important feature of treating people with myocardial infarction is to try to treat them as early as possible. The earlier the treatment is started, the less likely there is to be large areas of damaged muscle. As a result, the outlook for the patient is very much better, complications less, and the chances of the patient returning to a normal lifestyle that much greater. The treatment of a patient after a heart attack generally involves several procedures. The procedures range from invasive surgery to the use of clot dissolving drugs. With the use of thrombolytic drugs, uh, the size of myocardial infarction has decreased. One of the problems, however, is that with dissolving the clot in the artery, which will happen in about 60-70% of patients, there is still the underlying coronary disease. So therefore the patient would normally have a coronary angiogram, the state of the arteries is assessed and more often than not one finds a culprit artery that is responsible for the infarct that may be partially narrowed, 60, 70, 80 percent narrowed. That artery is then opened with a balloon, it is passed into the artery and at the site of the plaque the balloon is uh, inflated. Uh, the artery generally uh, improves quite considerably with um, the positioning the balloon. The treatment now is generally not only just to perform the balloon, but also to place a stent in that artery. It is a small metal lattice-like structure which is inflated at the site of the plaque. The results are considerably better uh, with a stent being placed in the artery. Uh, the chances of uh, restenosis of that artery are considerably less in the uh, next six months and it is a very, very effective way of being able to deal with myocardial ischemia 
following myocardial infarction. In the angiogram shown here, dye is injected into the blood vessel of the heart. The constriction of the blood vessel can be quite easily seen. Following the angioplasty and the placement of the stent, the flow is restored to the blood vessel. Ischemic heart disease is a very common condition, uh, particularly in Australia, and coronary artery bypass surgery is a very common operation in the management of ischemic heart disease. The operation for coronary artery surgery itself we simply get a spare bit of pipe from somewhere in the body, either some vein from the leg or uh, an artery from behind the sternum, the breastbone, and we sew that onto the coronary artery before the narrowing and then onto the coronary artery after the narrowing. That bypasses the narrowing and so we call it a bypass graft and because it's the coronary artery, we call it a coronary artery bypass graft. We do that for as many narrowings as there are. After a cardiac procedure is carried out, the stress test will confirm the success or whether other procedures are indicated. The stress test occurs at the direction of the cardiologist. This generally happens three days after release from hospital following an infarct, or five to six weeks after bypass surgery. Just take a seat over there. So how have you been? Pretty good. This is the ECG machine that takes a 12-lead ECG on the patient at rest um, before they start their exercise test. Then during the exercise test, they're fully monitored on three leads throughout the time. The reason that this is done is because if the patient has a problem, a cardiac problem, the first thing we're looking for is ST segment changes on the ECG of the three leads. As well as that, we're looking for arrhythmias, um, which could cause the patient to have uh, a cardiac arrest. Okay, so how old are you now, Ken? 71. 71. Okay, and you've retired. What sort of work did you do? I was a fitter and turner. This is the treadmill, which uh, the patient walks on. And it is, uh, we always use the Bruce protocol, which is an international protocol that was made up by Bruce from Seattle um, in the early 70s. And the patient starts off walking at a very slow pace and then each three minutes I increase the pace and the inclination of the treadmill until the patient reaches his predicted maximal heart rate if it is a diagnostic test or until the patient becomes fatigued or, um, or stressed uh, any stress feeling himself, the, 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 I would stop the test. This is the blood pressure machine, which um, it is necessary during a stress test to take the blood pressure at rest and each minute during the test. Because if the patient should develop cardiac symptoms of any kind, their blood pressure will drop. Um, therefore, the test would be terminated, so it is important, so I take the blood pressure every minute. The test is not a pass or fail thing. It is really to see that the patient can cope with exercise levels. Um, if I terminated a test, it would be due to hopefully fatigue, but it could be due to ST segment depression. It could be on the cardiograph. It could be due to a drop in the blood pressure. It could be due to ch patient developing chest pain. Uh, it could be due to an arrhythmia. If any of these things occur, the test is terminated and appropriate steps are taken, such as the patient's then referred straight to their cardiologist, who in turn, if the patient had ST segment depression and chest pain at their stress test at any level throughout their program over the two years, um, they would be referred on to their cardiologist and in turn then he would have an angiogram and either an angioplasty stent or coronary artery bypass or in some cases just be treated but with different medication. After a cardiac treatment, depending on the results of the stress test, patients are ready to join the cardiac rehab program.